28 minutes to 9. Welcome back to Sunrise Today. Well, now we uh, continue in our security context, but uh, we'll be zeroing in on some happenings in Kaduna. Well, uh, so the good, Dr. Sowadogo is here to tell us about that. He uh, happens to be a former commissioner in Kaduna State. He's also a political analyst. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you very much and good morning. Well, quite surprising uh, for some. Uh, the happenings in Kaduna to the extent that they may misunderstand and possibly misinterpret all of those clashes going on. But do you have an understanding of this? What do you understand that's going on here? Well, I'll start by congratulating Queen Esther Maokwe Ogun on her birthday. We wish you many, 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 many more returns. God bless you. Kaduna you is a very peculiar state. Many people do not know or have very little understanding of what has been going on in Kaduna. Um, yesterday we sat down and counted about 200 ethno-religious crises that have taken place in Kaduna. Uh, yes, from 1972 to oh, date. Okay. The number of people that have died in Kaduna far exceed any number that have died in any other state in the country since the amalgamation in 1914. Really? Um, the kind of publicity we get with respect to what happens in Plato or Binwe or even in the Boko Haram area is not given to what happens in southern Kaduna. Maybe it has been assumed that, look, it's a normal thing for killings to continue to happen in southern Kaduna. And uh, so the media houses give very little prominence to what is happening. If you look at what happened about two weeks ago, the governor was even out of the country. He was in the U.S. He left Kaduna on Thursday. He had to come back on Sunday because of the killings. And when they say, oh, look, 100, the truth is that maybe two or 300 people will have died. In that last incident, four villages were raised to the ground completely. Not a single horde was left standing. Women and children were massacred in cold blood. People were roasted in their houses. Those who happened not to run out were roasted inside. Those who run out were simply macheted. The question is, what is the motive behind this? What is the motive? In fact, I am appealing to the media houses to take a trip to these villages in southern Kaduna and see the monumental destruction, what we describe as ethnic cleansing, the complete annihilation of the ethnic nationalities in southern Kaduna. But is that to suggest that the authorities there will sit down and fold their arms and watch that happen? The authorities, is it the state government? Mm -hmm. the, the, what controlled, what kind of, uh, I, 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 I don't have to, I, I don't know what to say about this, but let me be honest with you, it is beyond the kind of imagination that many people think that has been happening in southern Kaduna. And we find it difficult to understand. Well, I will not want to say that the authorities are not doing anything, but we also want to believe that if something was being done, maybe we wouldn't have this monumental and, you know, a continuous systematic annihilation of our people. What exactly is the matter, Dr. Dogo? Because you, that you, is the are, question. They are grave. I mean, what you've said now, right now in the last five minutes have been pretty grave in the sense that you've said that the number of people being killed in Kaduna alone, you know, outnumbered the number of people being killed in any state. And out, even though some people will argue that that is arguable, but um, what exactly could be the matter? How, how will you trace? The cause of events. That is the very question we have been trying to ask. Southern Kaduna people are peace-loving religious people. We live in harmony with every single tribe in Nigeria. Not even during the Civil War did a single Igbo man, you know, one, one person was not killed in Southern Kaduna as a result of the Civil War. Not one. We have never in any form in all the provocations to say that, look, it is somebody from southern Kaduna that started it. We, only, we have only been reacting. And we have never in any form let anybody anywhere in the world come out to say that, look, southern Kaduna people just decided to go on the offensive against any tribe, anybody, whether as a person or a group of persons or any religion or any form. It has never happened. It is on record. What, whenever there is something, 
we only try to react and to protect ourselves. And in the reactions, in most cases, we even die more. Because by that time, the security agencies will have come out. And we are, we are simply crying and saying, look, we need help. We don't want to kill anybody. We don't, we don't even insult people unnecessarily, not to talk of taking arms to kill somebody. So why is somebody, why are some people trying to eliminate or to cleanse up the ethnic nationalities of Southern Kaduna? Is that, that what it is? That is exactly my interpretation, because there is no part of Southern Kaduna that is not affected by this ethnic cleansing by this ethnic annihilation, by this, I feel, I, I am telling you, I'm not exaggerating. That week, when it happened, for two days, I couldn't eat, I was weeping. I did not know exactly what is the reason. We are not at war with anybody. We are not against anybody. We are not politically opposed to whatever anybody wants to do. Even if we are in different political camps, we live and we go and eat and drink together. Who do you think carried out the attack? I the cannot country? tell. And that is what we want to say. Who I mean, we want to ask that the government should come to our aid. And um, I will say here, look, to be honest, yesterday I sent a text to the Chief of Army Staff, General Minima. I can tell you authoritatively, I felt so proud when he replied and said that today he is on his way to southern Kaduna. And I can show you the proof on my phone. I was more than glad. I couldn't believe that the chief of army staff, by just sending a text to him, that he will accept that he will go and see. But he knows the monumental destruction that has taken place in southern Kaduna. We have asked on several occasions that we do not just need a battalion. We need a brigade in southern Kaduna. We need an air force base in southern Kaduna for effective surveillance. We don't want the idea of saying that, look, planes will leave Kaduna or Plateau to come there. Let them be based there. We have the land. We will give it to them free. Look we will contribute them. to build even some of the structures for them. We will mobilize our youth to carry bricks. Myself, I'll go and carry it. Let us do it. Let us have these things. Let us, I mean, we are not at war with anybody. Why should somebody want to kill us, destroy us, destroy our crops, destroy our animals? It was stated, one woman was given a testimony that they brought a, took a little child a little child, you can imagine, and you collect the little child from the hands of the woman, and you do like you you slam the little child on the floor and scatter the brain, Dr. and Dr. That, Dogo, it doesn't make sense. Doctor Dogo, it's um, it's painful, but this these attacks have been blamed on Fulani headsmen, supposed Fulani headsmen fighting against the farmers. Is that what you witness? I will defend it with the last drop of my blood that the Fulani herdsmen are only being used, whether in Plateau or in Binwe, not to talk of Southern Kaduna. I grew up going out with these same Fulani herdsmen. I will go out from morning to evening, you know, grazing. How many are they? Tell me, a Fulani herdsman finds it difficult to sell his cow. Do you get it? Only when it is absolutely necessary. You will say that these Fulani herdsmen sell their cows, go to buy AK-47, automatic weapons, uh, uh, these launchers, what the military call it, I don't know, go and train, come in the night and go around and kill people that way? That is a serious, huge joke. Not even the worst illiterate can believe that kind of story. How many Fulani herdsmen are only used as scapegoats. And I will stand to defend the Fulani herdsmen to the last degree of my ability. Ask me. I told, I told people, don't blame Fulani herdsmen. These are terrorists trained in whatever way, wherever they are trained, brought to these places and given the arms, given the ammunition to kill, to maim, and to destroy our people across this very region from southern part. You know what even made me to, uh, when I heard that the, the military was organizing an offensive uh, against uh, terrorists in, in Binwe, uh, Nasarawa, and Plato, I say, oh my God, they have left out even the most vulnerable area, southern Kaduna. And thank God that the chief of army staff said, look, I am going there today. How many ethnic groups do you have in Southern Kaduna? Southern Kaduna has probably close to 200 ethnic groups. 
And all of them have been living together, as you said. In absolute harmony. Let me tell you, if you are talking of religion, my uncle was a Muslim. The mosque in my town, Kwe, the first mosque I knew is less than 500 meters to the chief's palace. And even around that place today, many of them are Muslims. Nobody even knows whether you are a Muslim or a Christian. Nobody thinks of it. So then nobody can ever think that it is that, that look, uh, uh, Southern Kaduna people are against uh, Muslims. No, it is not. As I am seated here, I have more Muslim friends than Christians. As I'm seated here, I have more Yorubas and Igbos that are friends than people from my area. As I'm seated here, I relate with them in so many dimensions. So if a person comes to Southern Kaduna and says that, look, you want to cleanse the people because they are anti-Islamic, it is absolutely false. Mm. So for a problem that has been on for close to a century now, you're saying that they have not been able to find a solution? That is what I am saying categorically, that the solution has not been found. Not even but by the now we want it to be found. Not even by the political leaders of that particular place? Well, if the political leaders have found the solution, maybe we wouldn't even be having Boko Haram today. So the question we are asking, how, why do we have it? Why has it been persistent? Why are people funding these people to come and kill us? Is it locally? Is it internationally? We, I'm telling you, look, we have resolved and we have made a submission and a protest even to the federal government, to the state government, to all the local governments. I am here appealing even to the United Nations and the European Union to come to our aid. Even, you know, because I'm, I'm just thinking right now that once you served in government, who was the thinking of government just at that time? You said? You once served in government. What was the thinking of the government you served in at that time concerning that particular problem? The thinking of government at that time, I remember very vividly at one of the situations we went to Kafanch and went some of the crises were brewing. We couldn't enter because it was already too hot. And the government came out and tried gathering the leaders of these villages to discuss peace. In my view, the problem is not from the leaders or the chiefs or the local people. There are people from outside sponsoring this terrorism. That is my belief. I stand to be corrected. But I believe sincerely that the crisis in Kaduna State are not perpetrated by the indigents of Kaduna State. It is from outside. I stand to be corrected. The way we have related with those who live in Kaduna, who are indigents of, of Kaduna, from Ikara to Sanga, does not portray any form of hatred that will result in any of them wanting to kill, wanting to destroy, or wanting to annihilate us. I know? believe, and I repeat, I stand to be corrected, that most of what is happening in Kaduna State is externally sponsored. 